Charleston, Georgia, at the Chumpkey Creek uh, covered bridge, the rebuilding, I should say, of the bridge. This bridge, originally built in 1895, was destroyed by the floodwaters that came through central Georgia in 1994. Uh, this uh, renovation on this bridge, or rebuilding, started in, in December of 1996. Arnold Grayton and Associates from Ashland, New Hampshire, in, in charge of the construction project. And we're going to be exploring uh, with uh, Arnold and members of his family today uh, some of the history behind their family of bridge building and more specifically the rebuilding of this bridge. I suppose our uh, society has had a long time love affair with covered bridges. We're going to explore that and a lot more things about covered bridges today and more specifically the rebuilding of this bridge with Arnold Grayton. And Arnold, it's good to uh, have you on Keeping in Touch today. Well, it's good to be here. Finally, a sunny day. I know that uh, you and your son carry on your uh, father's uh, love of preservation of building. Uh, tell us a little bit about your father and your family history and in getting involved in covered bridge building. Well, my dad started in the mid-50s, early 50s, when the flood control projects were coming into New England. That's where from New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, as flood control projects progressed, covered bridges were in, down in the valleys, had to be moved out, so that got us started moving bridges, and in turn they had to be repaired so they could be moved, so it put us into the covered bridge repair business. What was it about your father and even you and your son, and I understand now that you've got a brother that's just joined you, I think, on this project just recently that has made you all love these covered bridges so much? Well, I think we all have a uh, sense that we have to uh, preserve some of the past, plus it's a unique uh, occupation. There's not too many people doing it, and it's just uh, a chance to travel and see a lot of the country, and, and every bridge is a little bit different, so it's, there's no monotony. I know we're going to go down in just a minute and take a closer look uh, at the actual rebuilding of this bridge, Arnold, so why don't we go now? Well, I know uh, this bridge was destroyed by the flood in 1994. How did you originally get involved in this project? Uh, well, they, uh, the engineer that was involved in it and for historic preservation up in Atlanta um, was putting out feelers to try to find someone that was interested in it and uh, in rebuilding it, and uh, they didn't have too much luck. So. Uh, uh, an engineer I work with, Dave Fischetti from Cary, North Carolina, uh, got in touch with him, told him that he thought I'd be interested. So I, at the time I was working in California, so I came over to see what they had. They thought they had quite a lot of the old bridge left, and they did, but it was all in short pieces, you know, so it was, but it was an interesting project. Now this is your first uh, project in the state of Georgia. Right, that's right. How much uh, of the original bridge uh, well, I guess for starters, why don't you tell us how much of this bridge was destroyed? Well, it depends on how you look at it. What we've really, we've uh, managed to salvage about 25 to 30 percent of the original bridge, but really the whole thing was destroyed in, in the sense that it was no longer a bridge of any sort. So you're going to try to use uh, up to 25 percent of the original bridge, or you have used that much? I believe we've used 25 percent, and, and possibly we've got to 30. Tell us a little bit about uh, when the project first started and you got here uh, with your crew working. Where did you start? And, um, you know, as far as the building of the frame and those kinds of things, and if you could point that out to us, you know, where the original frame was started and those kinds of things. Okay. Well, what, what we started was uh, up here on the pavement. We built like a 130-foot long, uh, well, skeleton of a workbench, just a level 24 feet wide and 130 feet long to lay out the side trusses, which are now vertical, but we laid them out horizontal to bore the trunnels and and then we tipped them up after we got them all, all hitched together with the trunnels or a wooden nail. Exactly, how did you, you know, now the weight, once you got the bridge up, how much was that? How much, and I guess we're talking tonnage here. Well, each side would weigh around 18, 20 ton. And uh, the completed frame that we moved across the creek was about 45 ton. 
Now, exactly how did you move it across uh, the creek? Well, moved it about the same way they did 150 years ago with uh, wood rolls, uh, wooden uh, track similar to a couple of railroad tracks. And uh, we used a capstan winch, rope falls, and uh, oxen, a combination of oxen, horses, and a mule so, at different times to move it. I know on the last day that y'all moved it, I think the final two feet I was here, and I believe the, uh, the mule, you had a mule named Anna. Tell us about that mule. Well, I don't know too much about the mule, except she was, she was a pretty steady worker. Um, they had, I think they had two mules, one that kept the, kept Anna company, and, and uh, Anna did the work. The, one, the interesting thing to me, Arnold, is I just never could have believed that that could have been moved with a winch and uh, animals and uh, men. I was sure proved wrong, and I was extremely impressed with that. Uh, why do you uh, use the old method as opposed to some of the new things today? Well, the old is kind of in keeping with what we're doing. We're re reproducing the old anyway, so we may as well reproduce the old method of moving at the same time. It just uh, flashes you back into a little bit more in-depth into history. In your dad's book, and of course your your dad's book is entitled The Last of the Covered Bridge Builders, and it's interesting because I was on the internet the other night, and your dad's book, uh, as far as books on that subject are, were concerned, was the first one that came up. But to end the book, it showed a high school football team trying to move the winch to uh, to uh, move a bridge, and they were not able to do it. It looked like there was about 12 or 15 members of that team. Why were they not able to do it, but the oxen could do it? I don't understand. Well, the, the, the oxen is a... Uh, slow, uh, not a dead weight, but a real definite weight that continues on at the same pace all the time, where a football team is more likely to be, you know, if you got a dozen guys there, how many of guys are pushing, you know? And they may have the weight, but but humans just don't don't last as long as, as uh, an ox at the same, pulling the same load for the amount of weight of their weight. Uh, Arnold, I know that one of the things we want to do, we want to go up and take a closer look inside the bridge. Uh, I know that you've used uh, fasteners to uh, fasten the bridge that are not the traditional fasteners when we think about nails and those kinds of things and uh, talk about some of the lumber use and that sort of thing, the shingles. So let's go up inside the bridge now and, and take a closer look at the inside of the bridge. Sure. Uh, talk a little bit about the actual uh, the wood uh, that's being used and, and the actual style. What is What do we call the style of well, bridge is, building? This is a town lattice uh, covered bridge. Uh, Ithiel Town patented it in 1820. It was used some before then. We don't know whether it was his uh, design always that was used before then, but it was the same design. Uh, they vary a little bit from state to state, region to region, but, but they're all uh, pretty much a lattice um, bridge. And uh, it's widely used. It's probably one of the more popular of a dozen different varieties of truss. Why do you uh, suppose this uh, type of uh, building has been used so much? Well, I think uh, it's a, to some extent, it's a smaller timber and probably more readily available to, to saw near the location of the bridge. 150 years ago, we couldn't truck stuff like we can now, you know, so they had to get it nearby. And uh, they claim it's fairly simple, but it's not as simple as it looks. It, it really uh, takes some skill and craftsmanship to do it right, and all the old ones were done right, or they wouldn't have survived 150 years. The fasteners that are used, why are they so good and, and important for this bridge? Well, the, the fasteners are a two-inch trunnel, and that's a white oak wooden, white oak dowel or pin. Uh, trunnel is from the word tree nail, because it is wood. And what makes them uh, much better than a bolt is the, they're two-inch, and you have a lot of surface against the wood bearing where with a bolt a bolt would be probably a three-quarter inch bolt you'd have very little surface it's like your thumb compared to your wrist for the amount of bearing area you have now these trunnels they don't just go in real easily i don't suppose well not too bad you have to have a 16 
pound sledgehammer and, and anywhere from 14 to 18, 20 blows to put them in there. Tell us about uh, some of the wood. I know in your father's book, you know, he talked in terms of first growth lumber and, you know, some of the lumber that's not around anymore and, you know, as opposed to um, the lumber that uh, that is used today. Well, uh, the old growth lumber is, is a tougher lumber because it grew slower, much, much slower. Uh, and the, the woods were crowded, so the tree really had to fight for a little bit of sunlight, where now our lumber is, uh, it's, uh, well, it's grown more commercially, I guess you'd call it, so that they know how to make fast board footage, and it isn't necessarily as solid. So we've tried to get all, uh, mostly the heart of the wood, and you can tell which is heart and which isn't, but the, this would be heart in here, and this would be sap wood out here, where it's a little bit darker, it's a softer wood. So we try to keep as much of the height as we can. You talk in terms of after you get the frame up dressing. Tell us about that. Well, uh, after, after you get the frame all up and get it moved across the creek, then you have to do all the uh, roof trusses and all the slattle bracing up the top, the rafters, and shingling and boarding. And so you really, when you get it across the creek, you're only about half done. As far as shingles are concerned, what kind do you use, and um, do you cut them yourselves, yourselves, and that kind of thing? Well, these we we these shingles we cut ourselves from uh, bolts supplied by a, a local fellow. The bolts are the six by six cant a bolt or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's a six by six timber, and we resaw it and uh, with a local the help of a local fellow with his sawmill. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, then we cut them right here to length, cut out the knots and whatnot. And there are uh, cedar, and why uh, use cedar? Well, cedar is, it used to be local to this area, and right now it's just about all depleted in this area, but, but still it's the same thing they would have used 150 years ago, so that's what we're trying to keep with. How long will these shingles last on this uh, roof? It's hard to tell anywhere from 40 to 60 years is uh, what they, uh, what we've been told for this type of cedar here. Now, I know when you, uh, last year when we were exploring and talking with you about, um, you know, this bridge, you know, you talked um, a, a lot about um, some of the things that happened to bridges, uh, improper care. What are some of the maintenance that these kind of bridges need? Well, this one's not going to need much of any maintenance if there aren't any tree limbs that hit the shingles and knock them off and that sort of thing. It'll be very little maintenance. Uh, once in a while, a board might get kicked off by a, somebody that thinks it's easier to fish off the bridge or something. But um, mostly we've got this up in the air now two feet higher than it was. And with these uh, open approach ramps, you're not going to get much dirt tracked in, but usually dirt tracked into the bearing areas of the bridge where, where they make contact with the abutment is, uh, is the worst killer. This bridge uh, could last 100 years or more. Oh, no reason why it can't last 100 easily. Now, when we started this program today, we're standing over there by the concrete bridge. How, how long will those bridges last? Well, up home, we give them about 20 to 25 years officially. Uh, down here, you're going to get a little more time out of it. But um, even down here, the, the weather attacks the concrete. So um, the cost of the bridge, the concrete, uh, versus the cost of this bridge? Well, I think that they're probably uh, close to equal. Uh, it, it depends on, on a lot of, lot of small factors, but I think they're probably close to equal. The covered bridge may be a little cheaper. And I guess um, the first question I would have then is if, if uh, those bridges will only last 25, 30 years, say, even with maintenance, um, why have we stopped building these bridges if they'll last 100 years? Well, one of the main reasons we don't build them anymore is, is well, I guess there's two equal reasons. One, they're old-fashioned, but then you have this bracing up in the top and w with the big trucks and the speeds that you can go across that concrete bridge at 60, 70 miles an hour if nobody catches you. But here, a box like this, you know, you feel like you ought to slow down and, and you should. It's narrower. 
and they can be built wider but when you build them wider you get into heavier floor joists and and that gets the cost up again this bridge will not be open to traffic i understand no this won't be open to traffic i don't believe but it could support traffic um and, and how much weight could it support oh this will support whatever load you can put in easily if, you know a 15 ton It'd be comfortable well, I know that you've got some members of your family here today, and we want to talk with them for a few minutes. So how about introducing them to us? Okay. Uh, I have my brother Austin. He's uh, just started this last month working with me. Been wanting to for years. So Austin, this is your, uh, your first go at it, or have you done this type of work uh, in the past before? Well, I've done it off and on while I was growing up and so forth, and sometimes on vacations. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is the first time on a full-time basis uh, for, you know, 40 years or so. <laughs> so what is it like uh, being in a famous bridge building family, and this family is very famous? Well, it's a lot of hard work, uh, really. Uh, there's a lot of unglamorous things that you do, like down under the bridge, uh, uh, those kind of things that, uh, that are not obviously uh, of any uh, uh, glamorous effect for anybody. But uh, it's it's real interesting work, and and uh, I think it's a good a good thing for us to do for America. Did uh, your dad, uh, when you and Arnold came along, just said, "Look, guys, you know, you're going to have to help me with this business now"? How how, how did it work out like that? It kind of grew up that way. Uh, you know that was uh, that was what you did in your spare time. Uh, if you weren't doing schoolwork or whatever while you were growing up, you uh, your chores were working in the business. So that's kind of how we got started, I think. I know, uh, Arnold. We've got uh, your son uh, J.R. Grayton, and uh, we want to ask him some questions. So okay. if we can get him up here, well, I'll see if I can get him to leave his work. <laughs> JR, what is it uh, like following in your father's footsteps? Uh, well, it can be a lot of fun. I enjoy this type of work. I've been at it for, I don't know, 30 years now, so it's, I enjoy it pretty well. Now, you've traveled, uh, I suppose y'all, I know the family's traveled all over the United States. Where are y'all working right now? Oh. Outside of this place. <laughs> yeah, right here and up in South Carolina, we've got a job going restoring a church. So um, I guess you probably got some interesting stories to tell about being on the road so much. Have you got one favorite one? Uh, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we understand that. Arnold, I know um, we were talking about uh, earlier, I think I talked with you last Friday night uh, in South Carolina, and you started a new project up there recently. Tell us about that project. Well, the one up in, up in South Carolina is a, a small church, wooden church, that the termites have got into the uh, sills and studding corner posts and uh, we're holding it up uh, at the ceiling level with the uh, grillage they call it of steel beams so that it'll be suspended by the so that all the posts and sills will be suspended from up above so that we can replace whatever portions we have to from below with these uh, bridges, like this bridge right here that you're just completing, uh, will you have to worry about woodpeckers and termites and bats and those kinds of things? Not the woodpeckers or the bats. Termites, I don't think we will either because we're up high and dry this time. And it, the abutments are all clean and they'll stay clean with these, like I said before, with these approaches, they'll stay pretty clean. Built a bridge, I understand, in Michigan. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. And that was from the ground up, I understand. Yes, that was, that was a new bridge, 240 feet of uh, floor length. And that's three span. That takes uh, buses, trucks, and two lanes of traffic. It has a walkway on each side. I spent the uh, best part of two years out there on that. Unusual experiences, I know, in your dad's book. Uh, one of the things he talked about was y'all were getting ready to build a bridge and uh, suddenly the bridge fell in the water. Tell us about that. Well, that was kind of a coincidence. It just happened to happen on 4th of July. Um, I guess those things happen sometimes, but yeah, we were gonna, we already had the contract to restore it, and the next morning there was no bridge. I know this bridge, I know when we talked earlier last year and you were saying, Aubrey, the total cost of this bridge is like $250,000, but uh, it's actually cost you a lot more. Tell us about that, Arnold. Well, the, the 250 is the money that they had available to do the project. And who put up the money? 
I believe that was uh, through through the county. It was FEMA, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's all they had. It wasn't enough, but uh, it was a matter of either build a bridge for that kind of money or they weren't going to have a bridge because they couldn't go back and get the money again. That was a one shot. And you're a pioneer type spirit, uh, even though uh, we were talking about you losing money actually on building this bridge, which you don't feel like a lot of people really understand. It's because of your love of bridges. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's mostly it. You know, I can't think of any other good excuse. We're talking with uh, Lynn uh, Austin's uh, wife. And Lynn, what in the world uh, got a woman involved in this type of work? I go where my husband goes, no matter what he does. Yeah. So I guess you've traveled a lot uh, over the United States with these bridges, huh? Uh, this is really our first project. We're from Arizona. My husband quit his job there and said we're going to go do covered bridges, historical you're, sites. You were telling me a few minutes ago uh, that these bridges are sometimes called kissing bridges. Explain that. Milton, um, the founder of the uh, Great Nuno Associates, um, Dad told me once about a story about a bridge in Vermont, Emily's Bridge. Uh, it seems that um, she met the man of her life. Mm -hmm. Family didn't approve. They decided to elope. They were supposed to meet on a covered bridge. Lots of romance with covered bridges. Um, he didn't show up, so she hung herself. And legend has it that she, her ghost, wanders through the bridge. That's a very, very interesting uh, story. You have any more stories like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Ashland Bridge is, um, the Grayton Bridge has a lot of family uh, meaning because it was Dad's last bridge. And that was built in uh, what year? Oh, um, gosh. 1980s, late 80s, early 90s. So that has a lot of special meaning. Y'all rebuilt it or built it from the ground up? Ground up. Ground up. That was Dad's bridge. Lynn, thank you very much for talking with us today. Thank you. Aubrey. Arnold, I know that um, you you and your family have been featured in uh, some prominent magazines, been on Charles Kuralt's on the road show. Tell us about some of those uh, experiences you've had. Well, Charles Kuralt, I think twice that he uh, came up and did some film on us, once at Bedell Bridge in, in the early 70s, and I don't remember just what I think the next time might have been down Sheffield Mass when we were restoring that uh, lower Sheffield Bridge. And then we've... Uh, John Deere made a little film up at the uh, replacement of the Bump Bridge, which is the Bump Great Bridge in Campton. Um, the uh, Time magazine did a little article. Uh, National Geographic did two different films. In fact, I think they did some sort of a, a book on, on our covered bridge work. And there have been a number of others, and quite a few newspaper and, uh, stories. I know in your dad's book, uh, it's got a picture of you and your dad, and I don't know what the date would have been, because it didn't have a date by the picture uh, when you were in Life magazine. Do you remember that? I don't remember what the date was. <laughs> There's been, I don't get into too much of that stuff, you know. The bridge, uh, I understand that you built uh, in Ashland. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that was a... Uh, a covered bridge to replace a concrete bridge and the con that's a different twist yeah that's yeah the concrete bridge had been there well it was a covered bridge there originally of course and then the concrete bridge had been there around 50 years and it was uh, reasonably poor so they had, had closed it and put a, a bailey bridge across the top of it to carry the traffic which was quite inconvenient so uh, the local folks raised all all local money to build a covered bridge there in honor of my dad. So they named the bridge after your dad, or? Yeah, they named it the Milton Grayton Bridge. So uh, how big is that bridge? That's 60 foot span. It, the waterway uh, was narrow where it narrowed up to go into the river from the lake. Any unusual uh, stories that um, you recall? I know you must have uh, some over the years of building uh, bridges for such a long time with your father, uh, people that you run into. I know you told us an unusual story about a man not believing, uh, uh, believing that a tractor was actually pulling the bridge. Tell us that story before you think of some of the others. Well, that was on, on this Chumkey Creek Bridge, the, 
uh, oxen were on the far side and the tractor was here and we had the tractor just had it in gear and, and chained to the bridge just to act as an anchor and this man knew for sure that the oxen were just a front and that that tractor was pushing the bridge even though the the chain would have to be rather stiff to do it <laughs> but he was convinced that was what was going on the tractor was a pretty small tractor too some of the other uh, unusual people maybe that you've ran into along the way or experiences that you've had uh, traveling this nation building these bridges well there have been a lot of great experiences uh, uh, i can't think of any one in particular but uh, my dad di did uh, years ago in 72 he gave me a little challenge where he had in a town next door to ours that had three or four covered bridges and we'd worked on them all and, and he was going to repair this uh, 72 foot covered bridge it was a real light bridge and when we got it taken off the river and taken apart we found there really wasn't nothing to repair so he had uh, given him a price of $2,500 to repair that bridge because the road agent was a friend of his that had worked for him in the past and they were they were kind of buddies and my father had kind of a soft heart. So anyway, uh, to make a long story short, he gave me the task of rebuilding that bridge from scratch for 2500 bucks. And then afterward I had a chance to do another one and I told him I hoped to never do another one like that. <laughs> So you didn't make a lot of money on that bridge, huh? I didn't make even materials by a long shot. I might have made the hard way. Arnold, I know, uh, tell us what we're looking at right now in the way of the foundation. Well, if you start from the bottom up, this is the original down, from here down. And we raised the bridge two feet, sort of help prevent the same thing from happening again. We relayed this, and then you're looking at this is an original heel plate, it's called. It spreads the weight out over the, an area of the bridge. That's original, all four of those, all four corners are original. This here is an original uh, timber from the 150 years ago. And you can see it's cut with an ax, hard to see it with a camera, but it's an ax cut. It's almost as square as if you cut it with a saw, but those are all originals. So you're talking about quite a bit of history uh, in some of the old parts you've used here. A lot of history, yeah. The, this this heel plate is, uh, you know, it'll last up here. It had got a little bit of uh, tender, but it'll it'll last now up high and dry forever. Arnold, thanks uh, so much for uh, agreeing. I know we've been on this project for about a year now for doing this program for Keeping in Touch. Well, thank you for coming out. <laughs>